Today, we're going to be talking about a weight loss journey here on the Exam Room Podcast. This one, a little bit different than the ones that we've heard before, because today we're going to be speaking with someone who is a longtime vegan, and he also happens to be the co-owner and the chief relational officer for the Planted Expo up in Canada. He is now a dear friend of mine. He is the inspirational Steve Markovich. Thank you very much for being here, Steve. Thanks, Chuck. So good to be here. Coming to you live from Vancouver. It's a snowy day here, but we're happy and glad to be on the show. I love the Exam Room podcast. Been listening for quite a number of, uh, I think, years. 2018, I feel like, is when I started. Well, thank you. And and most recently, it was just a few weeks ago, you and I were uh, together at the Planted Expo in Vancouver. I had no idea that uh, we had so many exam room listeners uh, up in, in your beautiful city. I was so touched, you know, to have so many of your fellow Canadians come up and introduce themselves to me. Um, it really it really meant the world. So thank you very much, my man. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, we were glad to have you up. Uh, you were a hit. People loved your story. And yeah, people listen to the Exam Room podcast. This is what I tell people all the time. When they're asking me like for uh, uh, info or intel on like good podcasts to listen that are coming from a plant-based perspective, I always tell them, I said, if you want easy to digest, accurate, uh, inspiring medical stories and info, I said, the Exam Room podcast is hard to beat. I said, I think it's a notch above the rest. So Thank you, Chuck, for all the work that you guys do um, with the Exam Room podcast. Glad oh. to be on it. I'm honored, actually. <laughs> well, that, well, I'm honored that you're here because yeah. I didn't know when you and I first began talking about your story. Mm -hmm. And as I said at the top, you know, it's a little bit different than a lot of the other weight loss stories that we've had, but it's also one that I think a lot of people can relate mm -hmm. to. So let's dive right into that and give some inspiration yeah. to the Exam Roomies today. Um, yeah. At your heaviest, Steve, how much did you weigh? Well, I mean, the number that I remember seeing on the scale was about 246 pounds. I, I think I probably topped out a little bit heavier than that, but you get to this point where you're just like, I, I don't really need to step on a scale anymore um, because, you know, it was shame inducing, um, particularly for, for me uh, as somebody who, who saw themselves as somebody that, that knew better and, and knew, had some intel into how to, how to live uh, the kind of life that I wanted to live. Um, so yeah, I got I got pretty heavy there in my early 20s. It was a bit of a scary place to be. You say that you <clears throat> knew better. That's that's an interesting yeah. phrase right there. I think that a lot yeah. of us know better when we're making those food choices, but for mm -hmm. whatever reason, we just can't seem to do better. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, well I mean sitting here <clears throat> in front of you today at 160 pounds, uh you know, I feel significantly different and I have found some internal spaces that <clears throat> I was able to kind of work through and fill myself with um, with some courage, I guess, if you will, to uh, to really look deep inside of myself and, and trust myself and trust some of those intuitions and, and listen to the um, insights from people that I knew were going to be able to kind of lead me down the road. Um, that I was looking to go in terms of regaining my health and doing it basically through superior nutrition. Like uh, my weight loss journey is not a gym journey. It's not a fitness journey. Um, you know, I kind of put that out on the record frequently. People <laughs> ask me, oh, did you just, did you just start going to the gym a lot? Like, what was your workout routine like? And I'm like, I'm sort of embarrassed to say that, you know, I just kept at my regular activity levels by and large. It was all the things I was doing before. I never really stopped being an active person. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was about kind of rediscovering my love of food, my love of flavors uh, within a whole food plant based approach. But we can back the train up and kind of talk about my journey to get there, because that's really, I guess, uh, what, what makes it a bit of an in interesting story, as you said. Indeed. And you are a man after my own heart saying that it is not a gym journey. I think that that's where yeah. even the most fit people, the most active people who struggle with their weight um, kind of tend to go wrong. You know, they put 80% mm -hmm. gym, 20% nutrition, but I think that really yeah. those numbers should be flipped and that would put you in much better position, especially for sustained weight loss. But let's yeah. talk about how you did get up to that 246 number. Um, you yeah. were, as, as you and I have talked, you were very active growing up, like you participated in sports and I would think you were relatively fit. Yeah. So, you know, I grew up sort of in your classic Eastern European Canadian home. 
uh, very in love with sports. You know, I come from a Serbo-Croatian background and anybody that knows sort of the, the Balkan culture, you know, we're crazy about sports, soccer, basketball, volleyball. And then growing up in, in Canada, I was crazy about hockey, uh, you know, and I was just one of those classic kids that played every sport, was super active on the field. Um, and I really enjoyed that. But I ate a, a pretty standard uh, Canadian slash Eastern European diet uh, that was really heavy in cheeses and meats. Um, and I tell people all the time, I ate enough meat during the first 18 years of my life to last me the rest of my life. And uh, and so, you know, I, I learned to love food. It's actually part of the story, you know, believe it or not. I, I learned to trust my mother and trust her ability to teach me how to taste in the kitchen. So that's all part of the journey that expresses itself a little later on in the story. But I love food. I was a food kid. Um, you know, you didn't have to talk me into eating. So I was really active and I was eating quite a rich diet. And in uh, my grade 11 junior year in high school, I was actually playing volleyball with some friends and ended up blowing out my knee, not playing volleyball, but board sports, <laughs> <laughs> skateboarding, and uh, totally blew out my right knee, ACL, MCL, meniscus. It was like full rupture, couldn't drive myself home that day, had to have a friend drive me uh, back to the hospital. And in Canada, we have a great healthcare system, like don't let anybody tell you otherwise, but sometimes these elective surgeries, these ones that are not life-threatening and, you know, maybe could use rehab and, you know, all the rest of it uh, beforehand, you know, sometimes you end up waiting for quite a while. And I ended up waiting for uh, about uh, eight months before I was really able to see a specialist and kind of look at the MRI and get a sense of what was going on in that knee. And then I waited a approximately another uh, six months. So over a year from the moment of my injury to when I was actually able to finally get uh, reconstructive knee surgery. And by the time I got there some 14 months later, I had gained like 60 pounds and yeah. gone from like a yeah. 32 waist to like a 38 waist or some, you know, it was just, I, 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 I really ballooned in my kind of senior year of high school. I think I was depressed and I was just eating all of the same foods that I'd always eaten, except now I wasn't moving um, at all. And I'd stopped growing. Like I was kind of, you know, you, you eat a lot from 13 to 16 because you're growing like crazy. Um, but as it turns out for me, particularly, like I didn't grow much past 16, 17 years old. I sort of reached the same height that I'm now. I'm, I'm approximately 5'11". And, uh, and so, yeah. Uh, yeah, grade 12 was hard. Grade it's amazing really how hard. it's amazing how quickly that that weight can start piling on. And, I, you yeah. know, I think especially in your position, you know, here you are a senior and you're having trouble with your knee. By the way, uh, point of clarity here that during yeah. that year while you were waiting for the surgery, you were still mobile. You were still able to get around, correct? Right. Yeah. It took me, uh, I had a, like an immobilizer brace on for about a month, maybe five weeks. And I hobbled around on crutches at the school, but yeah, no, I mean, before long I was walking, I did a lot of physiotherapy to, to get the knee kind of back up and at it. Uh, but I wasn't able to play sports. I had no stability in that knee. So I wasn't really able to, to go back to my normal act, active lifestyle. I didn't go back to snowboarding or hockey or any of the other sports that I played um, during that final year. Um, yeah, well, the majority of my grade 11 year and a half of my grade 12 year. So as your weight is beginning to pile on as a senior, you're yeah. eyeing graduation and now you're eyeing yeah. your waistline and your health as well. Were you surprised at how quickly, you know, you were able to pack on those pounds throughout that year? I wish I had that level of awareness. Um, no, no, I, it wasn't until I was done high school and kind of looking at myself and thinking about what my future is. And that's when that whole shame spiral kind of really started for me was after high school as an adult, trying to figure out what was next. And then realizing that I, I was a different person in many respects, not just finishing high school, but I physically had completely transformed and was largely unrecognizable to myself. Um, and it was so sudden and yet gradual at the same time. So like over the course of the year, it was sudden, but on, on that sort of daily level, it was, uh, it was unnoticeable, you know, until, 
until you know you you, you find yourself you've dug yourself a really deep deep hole in, in that sense for me you know it, it felt really hard and and that's coming from like a, that athletic background you know and wanting to be very active and not being able to do the things i wanted to do so it ended up being that uh, the weight actually made it very difficult to rehab my knee so i ended up having the surgery while having all that weight on me so when i got out of the surgery uh rehab didn't go so great and it actually perpetuated the, the situation for me a little bit did the doctors tell yeah. you like, hey, you may want to try to take some of that weight off here during the rehab process? Yeah, my physiotherapist was amazing. Uh, I really enjoyed that that man. He was really good. Um, and he knew because, you know, I'd had a few sports injuries before that, you know, as a teenager, my my mom took me to see the same physiotherapist and, and he was a legend. And he told me, you know, like, this is going to be hard on your knee. Um, you know, you, you should find a way to kind of regain your fitness and that, and that, and thus begun my journey of yo-yo back and forth dieting. Um, but, and the funny thing is, and, and this is what makes this story so unique is that my yo-yo dieting was actually always tied to vegetarianism and veganism. And here's the reason why is that I grew up a Seventh-day Adventist and, um, and so I was familiar with the health benefits of uh, vegetarian and vegan lifestyles, because in the North American Seventh Day Adventist kind of culture, uh, you know, veganism and vegetarianism was not unusual. There were lots of people that uh, were a part of that, and they did it primarily for health reasons, not for some of the reasons that maybe we're more familiar with today around animal ethics. Although many did care about the animals, that wasn't their primary uh, reason for doing so. Nor did they really think much about climate change back then in the late '90s. Um, certainly when I was kind of really exposed to all of that, it was, it was primarily for, uh, for health. And so I knew, and I, I remember watching and growing up and observing people in situations where people were able to maintain and gain and kind of work through lifestyle related diseases. In fact, that's what, you know, Adventists always said, you know, if you've got a lifestyle related disease, diabetes, heart disease, you know, obesity, that turning to a plant-based way of life you know, whether vegan or vegetarian was going to help you significantly. And so as an 18 year old, uh, like shortly after graduation, I decided to go vegetarian by and large, like when I was making my own food choices. Um, and then uh, I got married fairly young. And in 2003, somebody handed me a book called Eat to Live. So anybody that's <laughs> been around the vegan scene, uh, for as long um, as I've been knows this book, you know, this is pre YouTube, pre Facebook, you know, the the internet's had information, but really, you know, you could find a little bit of, of your, 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 your bro there, uh, Neil Barnard, you can find some Dean Ornish things. And then this new kid on the block, and I don't think he was actually that young when he wrote the book, but Joel Furman wrote uh, Eat to Live. And that book resonated on such a deep level for me. Um, you know, his whole health equals, you know, nutrients divided by calories, like it just made sense to me on a rational level. And I liked the way he shared his stories. And I found a couple of, I think, uh, internet talks and stuff like that. And I was hooked, like I knew that this was the way that it was eventually going to get me out of it. But what had sort of set in, and why it took me over a decade to really kind of dial in and trust that way of eating was the fact that I had like some emotional addictive ties to food. And so as I was transitioning to veganism, <clears throat> even though, you know, processed vegan foods were not as ubiquitous as they are today, right? Now you can go anywhere and find faux meats and alternative cheeses and dairies, uh, you know, but back then it was, you know, there was a handful of largely Seventh-day Adventist brands like Worthington Foods, <clears throat> Loma Linda Foods, that were making these, uh, you know, gluten-based, seitan-based foods. Um, and then there was a handful of alternative cheeses. But, you know, like I quickly discovered that things like Oreos were vegan, <laughs> you know, and uh, of course, potato chips and corn chips and salt-laden uh, foods and all of this kind of stuff. Um, and as well, like, I tried to make my food and my salads taste better by, you know, using lots and lots of fat. So I would go back and forth trying to figure out, you know, how do I live my life in a way that uh, kept me happy, not kind of realizing that I was hooked on this bliss point pleasure trap with salt, sugar, and fat, uh, while at the same time kind of trying to live into this uh, belief that, you know, through whole grains and legumes and fruits and veggies, you know, I was going to regain my health. And it just, it just took time to kind of work through some of that emotional baggage 
Um, and I know that's not really the point of this story, but I had a lot of things I needed to work through um, in my life. And uh, I didn't realize that I was self-medicating via food and I would overeat. So I'd come home from a busy day at work, maybe a stressful day, some stressful meetings. And, you know, I would take my favorite vegan granola and pour it into a bowl. And, you know, that granola is not the <laughs> most calorie <laughs> uh, light food. And I take like, you know, a huge amount of soy milk. And again, both okay foods, but, you know, when you're eating them at nine o'clock at night as sort of your fifth meal, even though they're all vegan meals, you know, um, I was consuming food throughout the day much more than I needed to, and certainly a lot more calorie dense than I eat today. Um, and, and so my ability to sort of sustain weight loss wasn't there. I was eating a vegan diet um, and I ate lots of fruits and veggies, but I was also just eating too much and it was incorporating all of these processed foods and I just wasn't piecing it together well enough. And um, my first real shift um, came about eight years later in 2011. My firstborn son um, was a toddler and running around. And I, you know, kind of classic story was chasing him and like lost my breath. And I thought, oh boy, the kind of dad I want to be. And I still loved sports and all the rest of it. I was like, I, I can't keep up with this kid. <laughs> uh, but I had recently started to fall in love with the kitchen again and actually cooking for myself. And so I revisited Joel's book. And by that point, there were many, many other books and many other things that I'd been exposed to by that point in my life. Um, and so I, I kind of rediscovered and recommitted myself to as whole food plant-based as I could get. And so that meant like really reducing the use of oil um, in my cooking, uh, uh, reducing the amount of salt that I was using for seasoning. And, uh, and then the sugar thing was the last one to go for me. And that's, and, and I'll, I'll kind of touch on that here in a second, because it took me another few years to kind of really figure out how I was going to handle like vegan baking. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> You know, uh, at the time, there were a lot of people in my life that just really dialed in and became excellent vegan bakers, yeah. <laughs> you know, like making these in incredible cakes and cupcakes and cookies. And um, and so this these were my kind of like um, these are the sweet treats that I was sneaking into my diet. But I lost about 50 pounds there in 2011. And I maintained nice. that. So I went from like hovering around 250 uh, although I had yo-yoed a bit, uh, quite a bit during those eight years, I would lose weight, gain weight, lose weight, gain weight. Um, and then in 2011, I basically permanently lost about 50 pounds and stayed around that 200 mark. And it was a much more comfortable place. I became a lot more active. Um, I was sort of regaining some of that sense of self and, uh, and who I was in my body. I was becoming a little bit more in tune and in touch with my body. Let me let me jump in here real quick. Yeah, um, and, yeah. and we'll put the pin in 2011. Yeah. We're, we got some years yeah. still to move through. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> what, what really strikes me here is that you know when I talk about food addiction, I talk about it from the perspective of myself, who was 420 pounds, like wildly out of control. And then I relate so much to what it is that you were describing about coming home and having that big bowl of granola with the soy milk and dealing with the SOS, and 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 you never reached. 420 pounds, but you certainly shared in that struggle. And I think that that is something that a lot of people struggle with and they can be completely oblivious to it because what they've been eating their entire life just seems normal. They don't realize that they're actually hooked on that kind of food. So if somebody were to ask you, like, what was your key for being able to break that vicious cycle, get off of the sugar, all of the high fat foods, like, what would you tell them? that key is? Well, truth be told, Chuck, there, I don't think there's one key. Um, uh, that's a great question. Thank you for asking. It is a tough you know, one, it was, it? Yeah, it was a... One, it was just coming to grips with the fact that, that these were addictive substances, that I was um, honestly in a state of of needing them and wanting them on that habitual level, um, not just uh, on a behavioral side, like it wasn't just ingrained behaviors. That was a big part of it. And I'll talk about that, but it was, there was an actual chemical dependency on those things um, on that level of richness, 
on, on that level of like having my taste buds scintillated. And, and then I started to treat it more um, seriously. It wasn't just a willpower thing. Like I, I kind of recognized that you have to wean yourself off of these compounds or as I, I ended up going was, was basically cold turkey. I just stopped eating processed foods. Um, and I didn't touch a processed food of any kind that I, you know, aside from, I guess, uh, it depends really where you fall in like the tofu paradigm, but, um, you know, minimally processed foods, sure. But like anything that had a lot of ingredients added to it or fillers added to it, I just stopped eating them entirely in sort of, I don't really like using the phrase detox, um, but in that sort of, from an addiction perspective, I detoxed my body from, um, you know, from my dependency on those things. But, but that was, uh, that took emotional resilience to get there. It was, I'd, I'd, I'd probably intellectually knew that I was hooked on sugar, salt, and oil uh, long before that, but I, it wasn't until I could emotionally recognize it in myself that I was medicating with these food substances. And to kind of go back to like, why didn't I get to like the 400 pound mark? It's not because the behavior was different. I was just lucky enough that I was doing it through like one tier below in terms of the quality of, or one tier up maybe, if you will, of the quality of food. Like I was, I was eating vegan junk foods and I was eating like, um, you know, processed foods that were maybe not Taco Bell and uh, Lay's potato chips and Tostito salsa and, you know, Dunkin' Donuts. You know, those were not the things, but I was still overeating and I was still self-medicating just with like, slightly healthier foods in that sense. Um, and I think that's what kept me from really, um, uh, you know, maybe reaching some of those weights that other people would have been uh, over the course of the same decade, you know? Yeah, man, that awareness is it's critical. And I'm, I'm actually like really, really, really happy for you that you were able to have that awareness when you did. Um, cause you know, even with the vegan processed food, I mean, who knows, you know, how, how deep down the whole, um, somebody could go. I think that that, that yeah. hole can be quite deep, um, but you were able to find your way out. So now let's yeah, move forward. I mean, yeah. No, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Uh, I'll, I'll say more about that. All good, man. Uh, 2011. So let's, let's go back to that. So now you're kind of finding yourself in a much healthier space. You've lost some weight. You're right around the 200 pound mark. And I'm yeah. assuming you're continuing to graduate now toward healthier and healthier options. Yeah. You're right. So I fell in love with the kitchen again. I fell in love with my chef's knife and cooking. And by that point, I had really expanded my palate to the kinds of flavors that I liked. And I wanted to discover how to kind of make them myself. And so I dove into, uh, you know, my amateur cookbook chef like self and just started experimenting with foods and saying, OK, you know, it's made this way. And how do I make this nutrient dense? You know, how do I avoid some of the pitfalls, uh, the way that maybe it's prepared uh, in more traditional settings or, you know, just sort of adjusting recipes. And again, so that kind of circles all the way back to the beginning of this journey where, you know, my mother taught me to be at home in a kitchen and to be okay tasting food and to be familiar with food and ingredients and some basic cooking techniques. Um, and so, yeah, what really helped me start getting to where I really needed to be was kind of understanding that that uh that how food comes together and how flavors come together and what it is that i like and what it is that my body needs and there was an element of kind of working towards a more intuitive sense around like uh, am i going to eat more whole grains or more you know starchier foods and kind of figuring out what works for me um and so yeah but again, that that five years from 2011 to about 2016 was uh, where I was trying to figure out how I was going to just stop eating vegan sweet treats, you know. Um, and I'm not saying that everybody needs to stop eating vegan sweet treats, but I certainly needed to to uh, get to the place where I wanted to be in my life. Yeah, it's funny how some people are able to deal with that a little bit easier than others. Um, I don't I wouldn't say that it's jealousy on my part, but it is it's like a head scratch. It's like, really? What, what, what do they have that I don't, or what do I have that they don't, uh, you know, is probably mm -hmm. more like it. Um, it, it, the, the whole brain and food psychology thing is it just, 
it is really fascinating to me. And I, I hope that more and more research is done on it because I think that that would put the world, and I'm not overstating this, I really do believe that it would put the world in a much healthier place if we were to have a more thorough understanding of just how strong of a connection there is between the belly and the brain. Um, yeah. So you then, I mean, you were at 200 and how did you, you're at, you said a buck 65 today. Is that where you are? Yeah. Yeah. I hover right around 160 pounds. You got it. Yeah. So talk to me about that, that the rest of the weight. I mean, you know, did that just melt off once you got off of uh, the, the processed foods? Like literally melted off. Uh, some of the people in my life thought I was ill, um, but I was eating <laughs> I was eating so many amazing meals throughout my week and every day. I, I just really embraced the, you know, the approach of like a, a really lush and delicious, either green or fruit-based smoothies in the morning, or I would turn them into smoothie bowls, or I would pour my smoothie over a bowl of some kind of, of a grain, either a whole oat or a quinoa, or I fell in love with all sorts of different like pseudo pseudo grains and seeds and I would make my own mix and I'd do that in the morning for breakfasts and then I'd have an absolutely gigantic salad for lunch like like what what, what most people put down for like uh you know a dinner party of four <laughs> you know <laughs> everybody thinks and, and maybe more I would have that because I basically I took anything that was a nutrient dense food that I knew was health promoting and I said these are these are not off limits. I can eat these uh, uh, in unlimited amounts. And so I would really go for that. Like I, I took full advantage of that and made these really delicious, massive salads. And I still, to this day, I just came back from eating my salad. Like my wife and I made a, a, you know, a classic Murkovich salad for lunch today. And so I would have these huge salads. And then um, in, in, the, in the evenings, you know, I would eat very early. Um, by most people's standards, like if I hadn't finished eating dinner by 530, that was an unusual evening for me. And, you know, dinners uh, tended to consist of, you know, my favorite meal in a, in a variety of cuisines. So for a while now, I've been cooking and preparing food uh, uh, every day of the week based on a, on a different part of the world uh, that I happen to love their cuisine. So I have like a curry, Indian slash uh, Southeast Asian night. I have a Mexican night, uh, you know, and we go through and I've got kind of my, my classic Eastern European favorites that I grew up eating. And every night of the week is a different theme. Um, and so dinner, you know, tends to revolve around those themes and very kind of sensibly made and available for my whole family. So um, yeah. yeah, that's kind of where I went. And then in between, you know, just if I had to snack, I snacked on fruit. That's it. I, uh, when I was really getting off of the sugar, I never left home without fruit. I had fruit everywhere I went, always in my business briefcase, in my bag, in my jacket pocket, in my uh, glove compartment box. I put apples, oranges, any fruit that was in season, they were just always there. That way, if I had a pang, if I had a craving, I would eat that apple before I walked into my meeting in a coffee shop or whatever that case I may love be, the so fact that, that I didn't you had, get you tempted. Had fruit in your glove box. That's fantastic. It's yeah. like license registration, yeah. and I'll take that Fuji apple too. Um, yes, you got it. <laughs> but uh, so just so you know, Steve is not lying when he talks about these enormous salads. Um, at the Planted Expo in Vancouver, Drina Burton, who has done a number of recipes for Dr. Barnard's books, uh, she was on stage, she was presenting, and she was making this kind of garlicky kale salad, and it had, like, it was just a huge bowl, as you can imagine, because she's up on stage, you want the audience to be able to see it. Well, about, you know, 20 minutes or so after she goes off stage, I, I walk over to Stephen <laughs> to kind of check in, and there he is eating this salad. He's like, I couldn't let it go to waste, man. And he polished that thing off, and he just had the most enormous grin on his face. Like, you were happy to be eating that salad. Oh, there man. was no hiding that. Yeah. Uh, delicious. I mean, Drina is a legend. It was a great recipe. Yeah, it was kale, massaged kale with a garlicky dressing, just like you said. It had some pomegranate arrows in there. It had some uh, roasted sweet potatoes. Oh, boy. Yeah, you uh, see? You right? see? It, was, it was my jam, my jam. <laughs> it's like a month later and you remember it like it was earlier today, oh, yeah. man. I love it so much. Yeah. Um, yeah. So let's ask, man. We've, we've talked a little bit about the Planted Expo here, but... Mm -hmm. How did you make this big career change and just go all in into the plant-based space? 
Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's frankly uh, just been evolving slowly but surely. It might feel like it's an all-in, uh, but we have a fantastic team. If it wasn't for my business partner and all the people that have come around to make these events happen, uh, they wouldn't happen. Uh, but yeah, you know, I, I was watching and, and came from a background of pulling events together every weekend. I come from a Christian ministry background, and so I knew that I... Uh, sort of had the skill set about kind of convening people and pulling people together to celebrate and be in community around things that matter to them. And I knew that the plant-based world uh, had already been celebrating for decades with these veg fests. Um, and, uh, and I had pulled people together in my own way, uh, you know, a few er years earlier with something called the Think Green Supper Club, where every month I would host this big um, free by donation kind of meal for the community that ended up uh, kind of taking on a life of its own here in the Vancouver region for a few years. I don't do that anymore. Uh, and so I, I love pulling people together. I love pulling them together around, uh, you know, really great eco-friendly, um, compassionate kind of businesses and products and food things. And then uh, some friends of mine that had actually started the Planted Expo, which was formerly known as the Veg Expo, uh, had been approaching me for a few years saying, you know, hey, um, you know, we're, we're thinking of doing something different. And we know that this is your jam, that you really like it. Uh, you know, you should take over the show and make it your own. Uh, but that didn't really materialize until more recently. Uh, and so, you know, I really have them to thank as well for what the show is today. But uh, it used to be called the Veg Expo. We re we rebranded it over the pandemic to the Planted Expo. And it is what it sounds like. It, it pulls together some of the most innovative uh, and amazing small to medium sized businesses in a couple um, of categories, sort of lifestyle plant-based products as well as food-based products. And then allows the average plant-based or sorry, plant curious Canadian. So somebody that, that you know, has heard the rumblings in the news, like you, you'd have to be asleep at the wheel to not sort of see what's happening in the world around the plant-based movement. And what we really wanna do at, at the expo is bring these amazing products and companies in front of a Canadian audience that is increasingly adopting a plant forward lifestyle for the climate, you know, for their own health, uh, and also just recognizing that it's the more compassionate way to live. You know, people continue to have their eyes opened to what's happening, you know, with modern animal husbandry and agriculture. And so what we do is we put these events on, um, and it's a weekend. Uh, we bring in amazing uh, inspirational speakers like yourself, um, people that come from an educational background to kind of help people understand things. Uh, but mostly it's just a, an opportunity to try and buy all of these amazing products that small business owners, people that are just as passionate as me, but they're applying their trade in these uh, particular products and bringing them before the market. And we just love kind of shining a spotlight on them and saying, hey, Canada, uh, look what's happening here. I mean, it was amazing how many different companies were in that uh, that space. Um, I mean, everything from plant-based seafood to tea to overnight oats to um, grab-and-go things. But the, the seafood was really what kind of piqued my interest. Um, it really did. It looked and it smelled and it, they made sushi out of it, just like it was salmon, only it was from soy. It was it was one of the more yeah. unique creations that I've ever seen. Um, and it, it blew me away. Um, and shout out to the oatmeal company who was there as well, because their overnight oats yeah. were second to none. I mean, you really did. You pulled together such a, a, an eclectic group, man. That was a, that was a fun weekend. Yeah. And that's what we want. Thank you so much, Chuck, uh, coming from you. That is high praise. We want people to be able to walk in there and it's really low barrier. Um, having been a part of the vegan movement in various ways for as long as I have, you know, it hasn't always been the most accessible movement. Um, but as it has kind of pulled together this convergence, and, and that's why I think the plant-based movement is having its moment uh, the way that it is and why we've seen some of these massive IPOs and, and different companies being talked about um, is because we're realizing as a human society that uh, when you take some of the major crises in front of us, so public health crises, all of the public health crises, 
um, and you take climate change and some of the issues that are going on with our planet and how we need to care for this planet, wherever you might fall on the spectrum of, you know, we're, we're having an impact and a plant forward lifestyle uh, helps us have a much smaller footprint. Um, and then finally, you know, people are just r realizing that they, they need to be kind to one another and to this planet. And uh, the plant based vegan movement puts compassion at the center. Um, and so, yeah, that's why I think, uh, you know, we're seeing more and more um, companies, you know, when, when the Veg Expo now Planted Expo got started in 2014, you know, there was 35, 40, 50 brands that were there. And a lot of them maybe had one or two vegan products. And now we've got, you know, over 200 exhibitors and, you know, uh, most of which are like entirely plant-based or vegan, not just they have a, a vegan product or two that they're happy to bring to our events. So yeah, the, the market has shifted um, and we really want to make it accessible and let people know that they can just be as vegan and as plant forward as possible. Wherever they fall, like there are options for them and it's going to make a difference. Every little bit helps. And uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it really was just an explosion of plant-based business. Uh, something for everyone um, is is the best way to That's describe right. it. And uh, you, we also have coming up here um, in not too terribly long uh, into the future here, we have the Toronto yeah. uh, Planted Expo yeah. here. I'll pull that up on the screen here um, so people can see March 26th and 27th. And I, I guess you're still looking for vendors for this one as well. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, we have some uh, remaining uh, exhibit spaces. Um, and frankly, you know, if there's demand, we can we can find more exhibit space because these convention centers are massive. Uh, but yeah, if people are interested in being a vendor at the event, they can just go there, click on that Expos link in the top right corner, and it'll drop down to Toronto and they can send us their details and we'll walk them through becoming a vendor. But yeah, and also if you happen to be in the Toronto region, and you're just uh, watching this or, or listening to this and you and you see what's what's coming up. Yeah, tickets will go for sale um, sort of in the new year here. First thing with the, the month of January, or as we like to call it in the biz, the January. <laughs> yeah. January. Yeah, man. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, speaking at that one as well and being yeah. able to catch back up to you and, and seeing what other vendors are there. I mean, it really was. It was three days and I must have walked through the, the conference center like five, six dozen times. And I always felt like every time I passed by, there was something new that caught my eye. And it was just a lot of fun. Yeah. And then seeing also, Steve, like how many people who were there just to check it out, like how enthusiastic they were. They were like, they embraced yeah. it. They put both arms around this and just hugged the heck out of the, <laughs> out of the expo, man. Yeah. Yeah. Thousands of people. Um, uh, we're so grateful to everybody that came out, you know, we're still in the middle of a global pandemic, uh, you know, and so, you know, we had ways to keep everybody safe, but, you know, it's a sampling. Uh, it's been described as a sampling frenzy to come to a planted expo. You know, there's just so many little things to try and taste and see, and everybody was just on their best behavior. It was so good. It was such a safe um, and wonderful environment to be in. Uh, and so, yeah, we're delighted to be in Toronto. Super happy to have you back up on the stage and sharing your story with a new audience. Um, yeah, it's really great. Uh, we're we're really thrilled about the event. Can't wait. Plantedlife.com is the website if you would like to check it out. Uh, get your tickets here uh, in January. And then uh, also, if you're uh, an exhibitor, want to uh, make sure that you reserve your space there as well for the weekend, definitely click on over to that. And uh, Steve, man, it has been a real thrill speaking with you because you're someone who has also gone on this incredible weight loss journey. And I'm sure where you are today was not anywhere where you thought you would have been, you know, five, six, seven years ago, but nonetheless, here we are. And it, I just, I feel so good about the show and I can't imagine how good you also feel about everything that you're doing with the expos, man. Yeah, it's a real privilege and honor. I tell that to people all the time. I can't think of a more life promoting um, place to be right now. And that's what I'm about. Like give, all of us deserve to flourish. And uh, yeah, I've stepped into that my, my best life. I'm still figuring things out. But uh, when it comes to what the plant-based movement has offered me, I can just, just be so grateful. You know, I'm a new person, a new, newfound self-confidence. Um, and capacity to just 
really care about important issues and the plant-based movement has allowed me to do that with integrity. So I'm really glad to be a part of it. And I'm glad that you were part of the show today, my friend. Thank you so very much for being here. Thank you, Chuck, for having me. We'll see you in Toronto. If your health IQ was a couple of points higher than it was a few minutes ago, go ahead and like this video or subscribe to the YouTube channel. And to take it even higher, head over to Apple Podcast or wherever you get your favorite shows. Look for the exam room by the Physicians Committee. Hit the subscribe button there as well and help to make your world a healthier place.